All right, well, it was a real uh, pleasure to be able to be here this week. Uh, before I begin, I, I understand that John Hitz is going to come up here and lead us in a rousing rendition of Do Lord, is that right? Uh, <clears throat> he tried to get me to say I was going to do it, but I didn't fall for that trap. I, I heard you hazing the speaker in the first hour, so I knew better. But it really is a joy to be able to be here. I've been looking forward to this and getting to know some of you. look forward to uh, getting to know you over the next couple of days. Uh, this is an important topic, I believe, and one, of course, as you know and as uh, uh, Pastor Dean said, is quite controversial. Uh, but I think if we, if we uh, buckle down and think through some of these things biblically and are willing to wrestle through some of the questions, we can at least come to some conclusions uh, that will help us in our own ministries and as we uh, teach our own people. I wanted just to uh, highlight a couple of the uh, of the resources beyond worship and song that I have available here for this week. Um, obviously, we can't cover all that there is with relation to aesthetics and culture and worship and music in just a couple sessions over the next couple days. So I'd like to encourage you uh, to stop by my table. It's the one furthest in the back. They put me far away, so it would take you a little while to get there. But uh, uh, stop by there and, and look at some of the resources. There are some, some books by myself and some others that I think will be helpful to you. Uh, Pastor Dean mentioned Worship and Song, which uh, is the first book that I wrote. And then a short time later, I wrote a, a shorter book called Sound Worship. And you actually have a PDF copy of this on your uh, conference CD. I wanted to make that available to you. Uh, but I wrote this specifically for the lay people in the church. Sometimes a book like this can be a little bit much for the average lay person. Um, and so I'd encourage you to read this. But if you're looking for something just to introduce your people to the, the issues that we talk about this week and, and those in the book, uh, Sound Worship might be a good resource. And some of the sessions over the next couple of days are adapted from material um, in this book. So that hopefully will be a resource for you. And then what I did is I developed a teacher's edition of Sound Worship that integrates both books. So the idea is that you in a small group setting in a Sunday school class or a Bible institute can have the students read Sound Worship, you can read Worship and, sa- and Song, and then this will provide you with material for uh, for uh, uh, tools to teach it to your people. Uh, there are worksheets in here, study guides, and all uh, those sorts of things. I've also um, got a uh, CD on the table that provides you with PowerPoint presentations and those sorts of things. Again, I recognize how difficult some of these issues can be, how difficult it is sometimes to explain some of these issues and concepts to uh, people in your churches. So I'm trying to come up with any ways that I can think of to provide you pastors with the tools that you can then use and take into your congregations. Of course, I also am am available and I speak in churches regularly to try to help pastors, but uh, you can't address these things in just one, two, three sessions. They often take a lot more uh, to really fully explain what the Bible teaches about these things, and so uh, I encourage you to do that in your, in your churches. Which brings me then to a couple more introductory uh, issues for this session, and then we'll get into the material. You may wonder why we would, for instance, in this session, in a pastor's conference, talk about musical communication. You might think, well, that, that's fitting for a church music conference or a conference with a bunch of music directors. But why would we address these things in a group of pastors? Well, we've already touched on some of the reasons. These are controversial issues, and these are things that probably each of you are facing in your own churches. But I want to stress something to you this afternoon that really is one of the foundational principles beneath my philosophy and ministry with regard to worship and music, and that's this. You, as the pastor, are the primary worship leader of your church. This responsibility ultimately falls to you. Now, you may have qualified church musicians that take a leadership in the church and help to lead and guide in that direction, but ultimately, the buck stops with the pastors in the church. This really ties in greatly with the the wonderful talk we heard a few moments ago on your responsibility as shepherds. You hopefully are taking a great responsibility and weight upon your shoulders of protecting your flock from wrong teaching. And so you protect your pulpit and you protect what is taught doctrinally to your people. But what about those things that are teaching and shaping other areas of your flock, including their affections and their sensibilities and their view of God and their view of the scripture? That is accomplished largely through the music that you allow in your worship services. Truth is taught to their minds through the lyrics, 
but the music itself is teaching and shaping their sensibilities. And so it's my burden that, that we, as ministers of God's word, as shepherds of God's flock, we need to teach and protect our people in areas of doctrine, but also in what is shaping their sensibilities and their loves and their affections. And so part of that means that we, as leaders in our churches, you as pastors, need to have at least some of an understanding and knowledge about how music is shaping your people so that you can know how to protect them in that area and teach them in that area. Martin Luther said that he would not ordain a man to ministry unless he had some knowledge of music. Why would he say that? Well, he recognized the great power and potential danger of music in the church. And he knew that pastors, as the primary leaders of God's people, needed to have at least somewhat of an understanding of these things in order to protect and lead their people. And I'm convinced that one of the reasons among many that we are facing such controversy in our churches regarding music today is that 50, 75 years ago, pastors gave up any responsibility with music. They just turned it over to the music guy, whatever you want to do, go ahead and do, and I'll just get up and preach. Thankfully today, I'm seeing more and more pastors who are recognizing that it's their responsibility to take leadership in this area. And so I hope that these sessions this week will help to equip you and perhaps even motivate you to take leadership in the music and worship choices of your church. So my goal in this session is twofold. First is simply to provide sort of a musicology 101 to help those of you perhaps who don't have any musical training, perhaps you have some, some training, to give some of the basic fundamental building blocks for an understanding of how music communicates and shapes people and shapes the content, the truth content of the songs that we sing and worship. So that's really sort of my primary goal, to communicate these sorts of things to you. But also, my secondary goal is, again, to give you the tools so that you can communicate it to your people. So I'm going to try to explain some of these things from a number of different angles so that you can grasp some of the concepts that I'm, uh, that I'm explaining, but also so that you can take these things and teach them to folks in your churches. The challenge before us is this. Probably a, it's not an exaggeration to say that a great majority of pastors and Christians today would affirm what Pastor Dean said a few moments ago, that music is neutral. Music really doesn't have any moral effect on people. It only matters what words we sing, and then often that's not even a consideration. But the music itself, it's just a matter of preference. Whatever happens to be the, the style of preference for your church, that's the kind of music you use. That's really the predominant view that we see today. I'm going to give you one example of this. Harold Best, who's the Dean Emeritus of Music at Wheaton College, he wrote this, There is nothing unchristian or anti-Christian about any kind of music. He went on to say, The Christian is free of the moral nothingness of music. And I would suggest that that is probably the most common default view of most Christians today. There's no such thing as music that is unholy or anti-Christian. Now, how could they come to that kind of conclusion? Well, very simply, they appeal, at least verbally, to the sufficiency of Scripture. There are those who would say that we believe that the Bible has been given to us to thoroughly equip us for every good work, right? Paul said that to Timothy. And therefore, if we don't find any explicit explanation or instructions about something in the Bible, like music, then that means it's up for grabs and God doesn't care. And so, because you can't point to a chapter and verse in the Old or New Testament that says music is moral, or you can't find in your Bible a thorough explanation of how music communicates, well, then that must mean that music doesn't, doesn't matter to God, right? That must mean that he doesn't care. It's only your preference. But I want to challenge that on a couple of fronts as we, as we enter this discussion. Folks, the Bible is not an encyclopedia, The Bible is our all-sufficient authority for our lives, for our faith, and for our practice. But it's not as if you can then look in in the index of your Bible and find explicit instructions about every single thing you're going to face. 
Rather, the Bible gives us everything we need so that we can take this knowledge and shape our thinking and then apply it to every situation we face, regardless of what it is. In fact, we find in our scriptures, I think, examples that point us in this direction. For example, if you look in Galatians chapter 5, we find a vice list. Paul says, the works of the flesh are evident, and then he lists a number of things, idolatry and hatred and envy and jealousy and immorality. But he closes the list by saying this, and things like this. In other words, Paul's list of sinful actions in that passage is not meant to be exhaustive. It's not as if he's saying, all right, here's a list of the works of the flesh, and if you don't find it on that list, then it's up for grabs. No, obviously his point is to give a representative example of the kinds of things that are displeasing to the Lord, and then it is up to us as Christians to actively apply that passage to anything that we encounter in our lives, including our musical choices. And so my approach is to say, what principles do we find in the word of God that we can then apply to our musical choices, apply to our worship, this all-sufficient guide that applies to everything that we face, and then seek to actively understand and wrestle through the questions so that we can apply these all-authoritative, profitable statements of God's word to our situations. So there are those who would insist, no, the Bible doesn't say anything about music communication. And I would agree with them, of course, that the Bible doesn't give us a list. The Bible doesn't fully explain how music communicates. But I want to begin by showing you a couple examples in the scripture where I think that it is at least implied that that music does communicate to the spirits of people. I'll give you a couple examples. Number one, we find an example in Exodus chapter 32. This is the, uh, dis- this is the uh, event of the golden calf. Moses is on the, uh, on the mount receiving the law of God, and the people decide that they don't want to wait for him any longer, and so they convince Aaron to take their gold and to form a golden calf, and they begin to worship this calf. And Moses is on the mountain, and he hears music, or at least first it's interpreted as war. There's war in the camp. What does Moses say? No, that's not the sound of war. That music that you hear is actually the sound of worship. Moses hears the music. It is communicating a sound of chaos and distress, something that is initially interpreted to be a battle, but it is actually music. Now, I don't think we can prove anything further than that. But at least we can see an example where a musical sound communicates something to a listener. Another example is in in 1 Samuel chapter 16. This is the account of Saul being troubled by an evil spirit. And David comes on Saul's invitation. What does he do? He plays a musical instrument. The music, thereby soothing Saul's spirit, such that he is freed from that evil spirit, at least while David is there playing that music. Again, music having a great power to soothe and move the soul and to relieve someone from the distress of an evil spirit. Music communicates. Music shapes. Music can communicate chaotic, distressful sorts of messages that are interpreted as war on the one hand, Or music can communicate things that actually soothe men's spirits on the other hand. There are other examples in our scripture of music's communicative power. For example, in Job chapter 30, uh, we find this statement, Therefore my harp is tuned to mourning, M-O-U-R, to sadness, and my flute to the sound of those who weep. In other words, the, the harp and the flute are being played in such a way that they communicate sadness and mourning. Similarly, Isaiah chapter 16, Therefore my heart intones like a harp for Moab, and my inward feelings for Kir Hereseth. Music can communicate in such a way that it resembles, and this is sort of where we're going this afternoon, it can resemble the the feelings of my heart. 
One more passage, Jeremiah 48, 36. Therefore my heart wails for Moab like flutes. My heart also wails like flutes for the men of Kir Hereseth. Here, here it's almost a reverse metaphor. That the feeling in my heart feels like what the flutes sound like when they play. There is some sort of connection between my innermost feelings and the sounds of musical instruments that's almost instinctive and is implied in these passages. So the question then before us is, how does that happen? How does music communicate these things? How how does music communicate chaos and things that remind us of war? How does music soothe the troubled spirit? How does music sound like wailing or mourning? Or how, how, when we hear a certain kind of music, does it make us feel happy and energetic? How does that happen? Well, I want to take a few moments and, and talk through a, a basic understanding of how music communicates so that we can take that information and then look at the scriptures and say, well, what does the Bible say then about the way that we communicate? So how does music communicate? Well, music commun- uh, communicates by means of what I'm going to call emotional metaphor. Now, what is a metaphor? A metaphor is essentially a symbol. It's one thing that represents another thing because of similarities between the two. So we would say, my love is like a red, red rose. There are similarities between a rose and my love such that they can represent one another. That, that's a metaphor. It's a, it's a symbol. Well, music communicates by means of emotional metaphor. In other words, the sounds of the music itself resemble or mimic or represent innermost feelings that we experience as human beings. And it does this through one of two ways. Essentially, a metaphor is an association. We associate two things with one another and therefore they can represent one another. Well, the same is true with musical metaphors, musical communication. And metaphors communicate associatively in one of two ways. First is through what I'm going to call conventional association. And what I mean by this is association that is learned, that is somewhat arbitrary. Association that exists because we understand the the connection between two things and therefore one thing can represent another thing. Now, I'm talking very abstractly here. That's why I've got pretty pictures to show you to try to at least uh, make it interesting. But hopefully some of these things will, will uh, I'll be able to explain what I mean by conventional associations. Let me give you an example of this. If I show you the colors red, white, and blue, what comes to your mind? America, right? Our country. Now, here's a question. Is there anything inherent to the colors red, white, and blue that communicate America? Is there anything intrinsic to those colors? If I were to show these colors to an African tribesman who had never been out of his tribe and never seen another country, would he automatically think, oh, America? Well, of course not. There's nothing intrinsic to these colors that communicate America. The reason we associate these colors with our nation is obviously because they are the colors of our flag. In other words, it's a conventional association. It's a learned association. Okay, let me give you another example. If I were to raise my arm at a 45 degree angle like this, what comes to your mind? Okay. Terrible times, right? Now, is there anything inherently offensive to this gesture? No. In fact, I've been told by some older folks that prior to World War II, American children in the public school actually pledged allegiance to the American flag like this. But now, we associate this gesture with something terrible because, obviously, it is the gesture used by Adolf Hitler during World War II. But it is a learned response. It is a learned association. A lot of associations work that way. They are conventional. They're learned. And some musical communication occurs by means of these conventional associations. We, we learn something and so that when we hear certain sounds, pictures come to our mind or ideas come to our minds. I'll give you some examples of this. For instance, if I sing this tune to you, what comes to your mind? Mm 
Ba-da-dum, 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 bum, bum, ba-da-dum, 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 bum, bum, ba-da-dum, 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 ba-da-
this woman is pleased and excited to see you, right? No, obviously not. A facial expression communicates something because we know what's going on inside when we look like that, right? You can look at somebody across the room and you can generally sense their, their mood by their facial expression, by how they're moving, by how they look. Why? Because we naturally express our innermost moods and emotions physically in very similar ways. No one in the world communicates sadness like this, right? It's, it's natural. It's a human response. You see, with conventional associations, the associations are limited to maybe a, a certain culture or a certain time period. But with natural associations, they occur because we all share a culture of humanity. We all share a common ancestry in Adam. We all share a common physiological makeup, an emotional makeup. We all express certain emotions in similar ways, some people with higher intensity than others, but, but generally in similar ways. And therefore, when an association exists, because the connection between two things is in common universal human experience, we can say that that association is somewhat universal. Music also communicates this way. The most surface level is certainly the conventional associations. But music can also communicate naturally. Combinations of various elements of music, which really you don't really have to understand how it works, but when composers put the elements of music together, they can combine them in certain ways that they naturally express or resemble common inward emotional states or ways that we express ourselves when we are experiencing certain emotions. For example, if I were to uh, sing the following melody, what sorts of moods and emotions come to your mind? Bum, bum, ba-dum, bum, 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 bum. You're thinking calm, peaceful, restful, right? No. Obviously, we hear that and pep and excitement comes to our minds, right? On the other hand, if I were to sing this melody, what sorts of moods come to your mind? You think, boy, that should be played at a football game, right? No, we would expect that melody to be played at a wedding rather than a football game. That's a picture of my son a couple years ago. Uh, He actually started behind those girls. Um, (laughs) I was helping to officiate the wedding, and he, you know, he saw me and yelled daddy and ran up the aisle. We were, we were just thrilled he wasn't crying, but anyway. But you would expect at a peaceful, joyful occasion like a wedding, music to be played that fits that occasion because the music naturally communicates those sorts of things. On the other hand, at a football game, you wouldn't expect something peaceful and calm. You would expect a pep band to play pep music, right? Now, why, how do we know what, what is fitting for the one occasion or the other? Well, we know instinctively, just like I can tell how you're feeling by looking at your facial expression or your body gestures. In many ways, and I, I experienced this, that, that picture of my son was when he was two and a half. He's six now. And so I'm just now dealing with attitude problems, right? And, and, and I can sense what is happening internally by his facial expressions and his tone of voice. How do I know? I mean, if he's, you know, if I say, Caleb, go clean your room, and he says, yeah, I'll do it, you know, and I say, Caleb, watch your attitude, you know, he could turn around to me and say, well, Dad, how do you know that I have a bad attitude? I mean, can you see what's in my heart? And I, and I would say, well, yes, through your tone of voice and your body language and your gestures, those things communicate naturally to me because when I have a bad attitude, I express myself in similar ways, right? Music in many ways is like an attitude. We can naturally discern the basic communication that's occurring with music because we all share similar sorts of physical expressiveness and inward emotional makeup, and so there is, a, there, is, there is a reason that certain kinds of music are played in certain occasions and not others. There's a, music, there's a reason certain kinds of music are played at places of ill repute. 
I'll just put it that way. There's a reason. Why don't they play John Philip Sousa marches at the local tavern? Why not? Well, because the kinds of things going on there are more fitting with a certain kind of music. Music that naturally communicates the moods and emotions and physical expressiveness that fits those sorts of things. There's a reason. Probably one of the best examples of how music naturally communicates is with, is with film scores. You know, there's a reason that a movie can be made in America, and when they take it to a foreign country, they translate or at least put up subtitles for the, the words, but they don't change the music. Why? Because the music communicates generally universally. There might be some conventional associations that someone in another country might not get, but the general base natural level of communication is universal. I mean, you can be watching a movie, and there, it can be a scene of a, you know, a, a beach, and there are children playing at the side of the water, and the sun is shining, and the birds are chirping, and all of a sudden you hear, bottom, bottom. Bum, 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 bum. And you start to grip your chair, and someone can look at you and say, "Why? You know, what's the deal? It's, there's birds are chirping, children are playing. Why? Are, you know, what's going on?" And you say, "Well, the music is telling me something bad is going to happen, right?" Now, now, does that music naturally communicate shark? No, no, that's a conventional association, but it does naturally communicate tension, right? And that's where we have to distinguish between the two. People often point to the, the, the conventional association as proof that nothing universal exists. Well, no, you know, if no one's seen Jaws, they wouldn't know that. Well, right. But they would sense tension. And so the first people to ever watch Jaws, even though they didn't know it was, well, they probably knew it was, the shark was coming, but you know, they, when they heard that music, they heard tension. They knew something foreboding was happening. And so music communicates on both of these levels. Music communicates conventionally, and music also communicates naturally. And it is our responsibility, and we're going to look at some scripture in a minute and how to, how to put this together, but it's our responsibility as Christians, and in particular as leaders of God's church, as we consider what music is fitting for corporate worship or what music is fitting for the communication of God's truth, it's our responsibility to ask the hard questions and say, all right, what does this music naturally communicate? And is that fitting for the expression of God's holy word? Is that fitting for worship of a holy God? So how do we then evaluate musical communication? Well, I would suggest to you that although the Bible does not give us explicit instructions about how to discern what music communicates. It's not an encyclopedia. It doesn't, doesn't give us a list of approved styles. The Bible is filled with principles that we should be willing to apply to our choices in this area of music. I could go to a number of places, but I just want to give you one of them. Ephesians 4.29 let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. All right, so here we have a clear uh, command about not allowing corrupt communication to proceed out of us. Okay? In its context, Paul is probably most directly referring to the things that we speak. Right? But let me ask you this question. Would we not also be willing to apply a principle like this to things that we write? Of course. Would we not also be willing to apply this to things that we type? Of course. All of us would agree that we can extend the principle beyond its direct original context to the spoken word and apply this to any communication. Well, let's take it a step further. Could we not also apply this to what I communicate through my vocal intonation, or through my body language? Well, I think, again, we would say, of course. If I communicate something corrupt through my facial expressions or my body language, then I'm failing to obey this passage. Well, what I'm going to suggest to you is that music as a means of communication, by means of emotional metaphor, also falls under the rubrics of a principle like this. We should be willing to evaluate our musical communication to discern whether or not what we are communicating is corrupt or whether it is edifying. So let's consider first the area of 
corrupt communication. What does this mean when we talk about music? Well, we could, if we were to talk about communication in general, things that we speak, of course, we could come up with a lots, lots of examples of what is corrupt. I'll just give you a, a one vice list in Ephesians 5. Fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. Let it not, notice, notice this, let it not be once named among you, as become of saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are convenient, uh, but rather the giving of thanks. So here is a list of corrupt expressions, of corrupt actions. And we should be willing to evaluate our musical choices, whether it's the music we enjoy recreationally or the music that we choose for our local congregations, and ask, is this expressing something that is corrupt? Well, the first area that we should be willing to evaluate, and this would be the most obvious, is the lyrics. And it should be obvious, but I'm amazed with how many Christians are willing to tolerate or even enjoy music that communicates clearly corrupt messages through the lyrics. And let me just say to you this afternoon, if we are unwilling to evaluate the lyrics, then we might as well give up with regard to the music. We need to be willing to evaluate what we are allowing into our lives, into our families, into our cars, and into our churches for sure on the lyrical level and discern whether or not what we are singing is corrupt. But then we take it a step further and we ask, what does this music communicate? Now, I want to tell you, we want easy formulas here, right? I mean, you just tell me what kind of a beat is bad and I'll be okay right? And I'm here to tell you this morning, it's, or this afternoon, it's, it's not that simple. And I'm afraid sometimes in our desire to really please the Lord with our musical choices, sometimes we do sort of reduce the issue to a simplicity that doesn't exist. We come up with certain formulas that make music bad, and then we just sort of sit back and, and pass everything through a formula. It's not that easy. We've got to ask the hard questions. You don't have to have a musical degree, You don't have to be able to carry a tune in a bucket, but you can discern basically what music communicates by asking, well, what does this resemble? What does this sound like? Where is this kind of music most often played? All of those sorts of answers will help lead us to some conclusions about what this music is naturally communicating. Now, someone might say, well, what's the big deal? I mean, maybe, okay, maybe this music is communicating something seductive or something, um, something sensual that shouldn't be a part of my life, but I'm not actually committing the sin, right? So why is it wrong? Or why do I have to be careful? Or why do I have to evaluate musical choices? Well, I want to give you another principle that I think ply, applies here to our musical communication, and that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul writes, be not deceived, Evil communications corrupt good manners. You know, those of us who are parents, we're very careful about who our children hang out with, right? Because we don't want kids who are misbehaved to rub off on our kids who are angels, right? Uh, but, right, we, we protect them. We don't, want, we don't want it to rub off. Well, really, listening to music is a lot like hanging around with a person, have you ever experienced this where you're, you're perhaps in a good mood and you start spending time with somebody who's grumpy and what happens to you, right? Or the other way around, you're, you're feeling discouraged and so you go and you find that person you know is always uplifting and you spend some time with them and pretty soon you start to feel uplifted. Similar experience to what uh, Saul had with David, hanging around, listening to music is like hanging around with a person. You might not be committing adultery. But if you are allowing into your life music that is expressing the sorts of moods and physical expressions that are that are tied to that lifestyle, what are you doing to your sensibilities? What are you doing to your affections? At very least, we are disobeying Paul's admonition to not even let these things be named among us. So we need to be willing to ask, is this expressing something corrupt or is it actually expressing something that is edifying? something that is enriching, something that is uplifting, not just in the lyrics, although that certainly should be the case, but also in the natural expressiveness of the music. Is this expressing something like hanging around a person who's uplifting that actually uplifts my spirit? Is it corrupt? 
is edifying. But I don't think we can stop there. We have to ask a third question, and that is, is it actually fitting for this circumstance? In other words, there might be a, a kind of music that expresses something that is, that is noble, that is, that is fine, it's not corrupt, but it might not be fitting for a particular circumstance, like playing a march at a wedding. You know, we would say a march is uplifting, but is that fitting for the, the sorts of sensibilities of a wedding, right? There are certain kinds of music, certain styles of music, certain kinds of melodies that we might say, well, it's not corrupt, but especially when we are choosing music for communicating the holy truth of God, or when we are using certain kinds of music for our corporate worship, we've got to be even more careful that what this music is communicating is actually fitting. For example, bum ba da 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 is perfect for an advertisement about hot dogs, right? But is that fitting for expressing truths about our holy God? These are the sorts of questions we've got to wrestle through. Wrestle through. Not everything that is edifying generally is appropriate for the expression of something as significant as God's holy truth. So let me, let me try to give you a, a sort of a visualization of, of what I'm proposing here. It's not as simple as a list of do's and a list of don'ts. I'm not here this afternoon to give you a list of approved and disapproved musical styles. It's not that simple. But what I'm suggesting is that each one of us as Christians in general, and in particular as leaders of God's church, should be willing to wrestle through some of these questions, ask difficult questions about how music is communicating, and then work through a sort of grid work like this. Our first question is, is it corrupt? If in lyric or in the musical expressiveness, this music is communicating something that's corrupt, then I would suggest we avoid it. It should not be even named among us because it's shaping us in debased ways. It's displeasing to the Lord that we are allowing this to be part of our lives. But if it's edifying, I do want to stress within this category of what is, what is edifying, there is room for preference. You know, I said at the beginning, this is not a, an issue of preference. And at its root, it's not. But within the category of what is actually good, there certainly is room for preference, right? I might like one thing over another and you might like something different. We might both say, well, we acknowledge these are both edifying musical styles. I just happen to like this better than the other. Of course, that's fine. Of course, there's room for preference within it. I think it's important for us to acknowledge that. Then we don't stop there. We ask the question, question is it fitting for this circumstance? A wedding, a funeral, a birthday party, the worship of the sovereign ruler of the universe. It might be edifying, but is it actually fitting for this particular circumstance? If it's not, then at least for this circumstance, we avoid it. So I might love John Philip Sousa marches, but I'm not going to use them in a worship service, or I'm not going to play it at a funeral, right? In that circumstance, I'm not going to use it. And then again, I want to stress, within the category of what is edifying and fitting for this circumstance, there's plenty of room for preference. One more question I think we need to ask. What about those conventional associations? You might say, well, this music is not corrupt. The lyrics are good. The music is expressing something noble. But there happens to be a conventional association in your situation that is so strong that it's going to cause problems. For example, that American missionary in Great Britain, when he remembered the issue of that melody being the German national anthem, you know what he did? He shoved it down the people's throats. This is a good song. No, he didn't. He said, you know what? There are plenty of other things I can use. This has a conventional association that is causing difficulty for my people. It may, it may fade away over time. There may be a time later that I can use this song, but for right now, it's causing difficulties for my people. I'm just not going to use it. And I think that was a wise move. 
Sometimes we might need to avoid a certain musical style or a certain song or a, a, a song that comes from a certain source only because of conventional associations for the sake of the weaker brother. Right? We find that principle in Paul's discussion of meat offered to idols. He, what, what does he say? The meat's good. There's nothing wrong with the meat. We all know the idol is false. I have every right in the world to eat this meat, Paul says, but I'm not going to. Why? Because there was a conventional association of that meat with the temple that would have caused some weaker brethren in the church to stumble into sin. And so Paul had the liberty to give up what was legitimately his right for the sake of the weaker brother. The other principle is for the sake of the gospel. There might be conventional association with something that is inherently good, but it would cause unbelievers to really question us as Christians. Really? You guys use that kind of music? Well, if it's going to hinder the gospel, we have freedom to give it up, at least until that conventional association passes away. So here are four questions we need to be willing to ask. Is it corrupt? It's not going to be easy to determine that sometimes, but it's necessary. Is it edifying? Is it fitting for this particular circumstance? And what about those conventional associations? I think each one of us should be willing to work through a framework like this. And I want to say this. If each one of us goes through something like this, we might come to slightly different conclusions. And that's sometimes uneasy. But it's going to happen. Why? Because we don't have explicit chapter and verse and specific lists. You know, I am not as concerned that people come to the exact same conclusions and applications as I do even though I'm right. (laughs) I'm mostly concerned that people are willing to work through this sort of process. But most people are not. That's my greatest burden. Most Christians today say, why would I even worry about this? God doesn't care. It just matters what I like. What I want to stress is that God is God is pleased not when we just sit back on our couch and say, well, as long as I don't murder and steal, I'm okay. God is pleased when we actively apply the all-sufficient, all-authoritative word of God to every area of our lives. You see, I really believe that it is those who say, if the Bible doesn't say anything about it, it doesn't matter. They are actually limiting the sufficiency of Scripture. I believe the Bible speaks to everything, whether or not Paul knew hip-hop was coming down the road someday. The Bible applies to hip-hop. The Bible applies to everything. It is sufficient for every good work. Well, you might say, well, if we're all going to come to different conclusions, then, what's, then, then why bother? Well, because God is pleased through the process and because we can't all be right. You know, someone's got to be wrong. And so it is valuable to work together, to wrestle through these things. It's why God has given the local church. God doesn't intend for this process to be accomplished by an individual Lone Ranger Christian, speaking of Lone Ranger. God gave us the church so that we can work together, so that brothers and sisters in Christ can say, you know what, I I like this kind of music. What do you think? I'm sort of blind to what it it communicates because I like it so much. And and ask your pastor, ask your, your fellow brother and sister in Christ. We need to wrestle through these things together and come to God pleasing decisions. I'm most concerned with people who are unwilling to do that. There are no easy pat answers. There are no formulas. But folks, this is called active sanctification. We do this in lots of areas of our lives, right? If I want to know how to please the Lord with my driving, you say, man, he's stepping on my toes with music. He's going to talk about driving too. You know. Uh, hey, I just drove drove from Fort Worth today and I saw a couple cops, so, you know. Uh, If we want to please the Lord with our driving, what do we do? Well, we know there are principles in the Word of God about obeying those that God has put over us and caring about the safety of others, but there's nothing in the Bible that says anything about speed limits. So it doesn't matter, right? Thank you for that amen. No, we say, hey, there are principles. I need to understand the rules of the road I apply the principles to the issue. If I want to please the Lord with my health, wow, strike three. I find principles in the word of God. I understand principles of caring about my body. 
and I apply the principles. And if we want to please the Lord with our musical choices in all of life and for sure with what we choose in our corporate worship, we need to mine the word of God for the principles that are applicable. We need to take the time and effort to understand the issue. How does it communicate? How can we determine this? How can we discern these things? And then we need to be willing to apply those principles actively to the issue of music. I think the Lord is pleased when we are willing to go through this sort of process. And I'm convinced he's not pleased if we just say it's all up for whim or preference. All right, so we've got a good 15 minutes. I know there are questions. Feel free to ask me anything as long as I have the right to say, I don't know. So... Yes, my question goes to the um, <clears throat> the beat of the music, and um, over time, uh, we we've seen this evolve. We don't see it, obviously don't see it in the older hymns, uh, whether they're doctrinal or not. Um, how significant do you see that uh, yep. the beat of, of music, especially in today's um, celebration of worship? Yeah, good. So all music has rhythm, right? The music would not be music without rhythm. All music has a beat in that sense. Um, But certainly there are certain beats, certain rhythms that are characteristic of certain styles of music. And rhythm, beat, is one of those elements that contributes to the general communicative power of music. So that is certainly one of the elements that we should consider. And with rhythm, what I want to ask is, um, what physical movements does that kind of rhythm mimic? Right? Rhythm can mimic walking. Rhythm can mimic running, can mimic skipping. It can mimic all kinds of physical movements, and it can mimic conjugal relations, to put it that way. Uh, So it is one of the elements among all of them that I think play into what the music is naturally communicating. Uh, And so music that arises out of a value system that wants to um, celebrate free sexuality is going to employ certain elements, certain rhythms, all sorts of things that naturally communicate what the original <laughs> intention of that music is going to be. What about instrumentation? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so, the Psalms say they're written for stringed instruments. Mm-hmm. Our traditional hymns are played either with pianos or organs, but we, you know, we did, they didn't have pianos and organs back when the psalm was, songs were written. After the uh, Red Sea event, they got out tambourines. You know, Marion got out tambourines and stuff like that. Yep. What, what do you think about what instruments? I mean, yep. could someone hypothetically pay, play a song that was fitting and appropriate and not corrupt with an electric guitar. I'm, I'm talking about, you know, right. like that. Yeah, Good, great question. Okay, so with instruments, we have the same two issues. There are conventional associations, and there's what the, how, the music natural, or how the instrument naturally sounds. Okay, so for example, could I fittingly play Holy, Holy, Holy on a kazoo? <laughs> okay, maybe... Uh, I would suggest probably there's conventional associations there that would make it difficult, and the sound of a kazoo, you know, it does, does it quite fit holy, holy, holy. So in other words, with all instruments, we've got to ask both questions. So for example, with something like the piano, both things are in question. And at one time, the piano was considered unfitting for corporate worship. Why? Was it something natural? No, there's nothing naturally offensive about the sound of the ivories. But there was a strong conventional association between the piano and the tavern such that it would have caused a problem. An association that I would suggest probably doesn't exist anymore, right? Okay. What about something like the electric guitar? Are there conventional problems? Maybe, probably, but even beyond that, let's say there's no conventional problems. What, what does the sound of an electric guitar communicate? 
with the deliberate distortion. Okay, these are. I'm not going to. I'm, I'm not here to draw conclusions. Okay, um, but but those are the questions that need to be asked, regardless of the instrument. What are the conventional associations? Acknowledging those come and go. There may be a time when I can't use this, and later I can. And someone cries, "You're inconsistent." Well, no. On the level of conventional associations, things do fade away. Associations do fade away. But on the level of natural, what does it actually sound like? Okay, so I'm not going to play the fanfare of a wedding march on a flute. That instrument is incapable of communicating things that are fitting for that fanfare. So there, there is intrinsic to certain instruments a capability to do some things and an incapability to do other things. And I would suggest some instruments are probably incapable of communicating reverent truth just because of deficiencies within the instrument itself. So both questions I think are important, conventional and natural. Yeah. You're superseded. Of course, both piano and I forget what else you meant are stringed instruments. So, Scott, I wanted to uh, thank you so much for your presentation today. <clears throat> your comments about a natural, the natural associations, um, speak to the fact I think that God's general revelation is all over the place. Right. So, what you've said today applies. To all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I come out of a math background, and it's interesting that Christians have the idea that math is neutral. It isn't. And in the 19, 20th century, after we had the chaos of the philosophers in the late uh, 1800s, um, there are mathematicians today that do not accept certain laws of logic, mm -hmm. like uh, reductio ad absurdum and so on, mm -hmm. because they can't arrive at any truth, and any truth that can't be arrived at by human logic, therefore, doesn't exist and is irrelevant, whereas we in our, we look upon an omniscient God, he certainly knows how many decimal places of, you know, so forth. So in music, when, when, when the philosophy of the uh, 18th, uh, 1800s um, spilled over into the 20th century, and you had the rise of Stravinsky and that kind of a music style. Wasn't that using frequencies and chords deliberately expressing a philosophical view? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, in some cases, there's a connection uh, between what the music is naturally doing and the philosophical construct or intention of the composer. It's not always the case, actually, but in, in the cases you mentioned, it for sure was. There was this deliberate attempt to free music from any um, uh, uh, naturally occurring acoustical constructs, right? Um, and there was definitely philosophical um, roots beneath that, for sure. Yeah. Good. Uh, Scott, my question deals with uh, the issue of manipulation Mm -hmm. And what an artist, and any art, is doing um, in the concept of manipulation. He, he's trying, with his art, like with composition, he's trying to um, to create something that wasn't there. And the recipient, as you've said, they, they, they we're shaping, we're communicating. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I guess, would you say that, as a musicologist, with your understanding of, of music theory, that and, and as a pastor that it's appropriate for the musical score, for the musical side of things to, um, to create a, a, an appropriate emotional state without lyrical content. And, and the reason I'm asking is because there, there's like two views that I'm, I'm hearing. One is in the con traditional or conservative side of this mm -hmm. argument. Um, one is that uh, if you have um, a correspondence, that's all you need between the lyrics and the, the music. And the other is that, no, um, you actually have to get your emotional state from the lyrics, and then we don't want to have too much manipulation from the, from the music. So I just want to hear, hear your idea on that spectrum. Yeah, very good question and, and very difficult to answer simply. Um, I'm actually going to address a little bit of that tonight. 
uh, and the issue of of emotion and how it relates to worship and how it should be uh, how it should be connected. But I'll just say this: um, through the history of uh, musicology and philosophy concerning these things, uh, philosophers always distinguish between two kinds of music. And they've used different terms to describe them. Sometimes it was it was uh, the distinction was called um, carnal versus spiritual. Uh, you could use the terms romantic versus classical. They even used Greek gods as metaphors and and distinguished between Dionysian and Apollonian. Okay, the difference between the two is that the carnal or the romantic or the Dionysian music is that which sort of just sweeps you up and moves you without any intellect whatsoever. It just takes you somewhere. The, what was, more, what was called spiritual or um, classic or Apollonian was music that slowly and modestly shaped you, but you had to be involved in the process. It didn't just sweep you and take you somewhere. It gave you the material for your expression of your heart's affections. Um, I like to, to the, the terms I use, because some of those are so abstract, is immodest, modest. Immodest meaning music that just draws attention to itself and just wraps you up and takes you somewhere. Modest music being that, you know, because all music does shape us, but modest music does so in a modest way, in a, in a way that doesn't draw attention to itself. So the, my first answer to that would be when it comes to worship, I want to, and this is all in a continuum, but I want to lean toward more of the modest kinds of music so that I'm not being swept out without any intellect. The second question is, are words necessary? Um, I, my answer to that would be, in theory, no. However, in our entertainment culture, it's almost impossible for someone to sit and listen to a purely instrumental music with no lyrics and not fall into an entertainment sort of mindset. So I recommend that there always be some truth content in the context of corporate worship. That might mean we give the people a psalm to read as they hear this, or it might mean that the words actually have lyrics. But I want to, in in order to make sure the music is not manipulating, I want to make sure the people's minds are actively engaged. Um, So, you know, someone who knows music and who's not just there for the entertainment, I think can have their minds actively engaged without a lyric, but that's very rare today because of our culture. Um, so that begins to answer the question. Again, it's, I think it's a little more complex than that, but maybe that at least starts the answer. Very good question, though. Scott, I think your model fits very well with uh, <clears throat> probably our frame of reference for Western music, but can you kind of fit that yeah. model to non-Western music? Mm-hmm say, Japanese music, right. how would that apply to a worship service? Yep, I, you absolutely. Know, I think of the twangs and that sort of thing mm-hmm. from their type of instruments. And also, uh, I've been to a few Muslim uh, countries, and their morning prayer or their morning call to worship, whatever, I don't understand what they're singing, the lyrics, but is my uh, rejection of that, is that a natural rejection, or is that a conventional rejection, or a little bit of both? Okay, good. Um, I would say, first of all, when it comes to non-Western music, both of these categories still apply, conventional and natural. Now, uh, a lot of that music sounds very foreign to us, right? Um, But I actually have an article on my site where I seek to prove that the universals and the similarities between Western music and non-Western music are actually far greater than the differences. And usually the differences, what sounds foreign to us, is usually at the surface level, something like instrumentation. So certain cultures uh, gravitate towards certain instruments rather than others. We hear those instruments we naturally associate it, and it's foreign to us because we don't have those instruments. You know, we don't have gamelons or things. You know, uh, so we hear that, and it's oh, that sounds Asian, or that sounds Indian. Well, what we're what we're associating is more conventional, but it is something natural. Um, so there are uh, there are more universals, I think, than than um, 
than differences. Um, even in things like scales, um, you know, we often associate the the five note pentatonic scale with with you know Asian Chinese, right? But all folk music around the world is based on that. Um, Jesus loves me is is based on that sort of sort of scale. Um, American folk music is based on that sort of scale. It's more, I think, the the um, the intonation of the voice of the singers and the kind of instruments that are used that we say, oh, that sounds strange, and that's Asian. So, in other words, I want to emphasize the fact that the universals really are more predominant across cultures because, again, we share a culture of humanity than are the differences. Having said that, there are differences, um, and there might be certain conventional associations uh, with certain music and a certain culture that would make it inappropriate or appropriate depending on the circumstance. So a missionary needs to be sensitive to all of that. A missionary might hear something and say, well, this sounds noble, but his, his uh, converts are saying, but that's associated with this. I've actually read accounts of uh, missionaries who go into a field and the people, these new converts say, we shouldn't use this music. This is the music of, of our pagan worship. And the missionary insists, no, you should use this. I would say, regardless of whether or not it's naturally communicating something bad, if these sensitive new convert hearts say this is not appropriate, then there's obviously something conventional there that you know that should render it inappropriate. Um, what was the second question? Oh yeah, so with yeah, with like when you hear the right when you hear the Islamic, um, it's probably a little bit of both. I would say probably the strongest reaction is conventional. We hear that, we hear Islam, we hear terrorist, we hear whatever. You know, when you hear that kind of chanting. Um, however, you know how they chant their prayers is probably very similar to how the Jews chanted their their prayers, um, with some differences, I'm sure. So it's probably you know somewhat conventional. Um, chanting usually is just a step above natural vocal human intonation. Like when I talk, my voice rises and falls. I have a certain rhythm. You just make that a little more, and now I'm chanting. You know, um, so uh, there's there's some of that that's just naturally flowing from. That, that's the basic form of music. Um, but I think sometimes we we conventionally associate certain things, and that you know things come to our mind too. So good. Okay, well, it's 4.30, so it's time for us to uh, stop. Scott, that was a tremendous presentation. All right, so we'll be back here tonight. We'll start at our evening uh, worship service. It's